like to start the meeting off by properly introducing our guest speaker, Albert Earl Carter. Al Carter is a medical journalist, international consultant, and educator of the healthy cell concept and rebound exercise. He carries the distinction of being the world's foremost authority on the most efficient and effective form of exercise yet devised by man. His book, The Miracles of Rebound Exercise, sold over 1.3 million copies before it was revised in 1988. Professor Carter's teachings have affected the lives of millions of people all over the world. Some of the followers of Rebound Exercise include fitness expert Jack LaLanne, comedian Bob Pope, and former president Ronald Reagan. Internationally, Carter found Rebound Dynamics of Hong Kong, Singapore, Israel, Switzerland, and the Philippines, as well as the Australian Institute of Reboundology. Limited and the International Institute of Reboundology, London. In 1983, Mr. Carter was a paid consultant to the Hong Kong government, teaching the health benefits of rebound exercise to the 35,000 members of the Hong Kong police force and fire departments. Because of his research and knowledge, Carter is a spellbinding speaker who can relate to the common person as easily as he can face the toughest challenges of the medical profession. Mr. Carter's research has been confirmed by NASA, the United States Air Force, Dr. Kenneth Cooper's Institute of Aerobics Research, and the Hong Kong University. Al has also appeared on national television in the US, Australia, Hong Kong, and the Philippines, and on countless radio and television talk shows, explaining the healthy, healthy cell concept and the health benefits of rebound exercise. His latest book, The Cancer Answer, is provocative and startling. It contains a formula for health and at the same time provides a shocking expose of the massive misinformation about cancer we have been receiving from the medical establishment. And with that, <laughs> I would like to bring up Alex Carter. Let's all give him a hand. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be involved in some rather exciting things this evening. But I don't want you to sit here for too long. So what I'd like all of you to do is I'd like you to stand up, please. Would you all stand up? And everybody hold your hands up in the air like this. And everybody clap your hands once. Clap your hands twice. And clap your hands three times. Thank you very much for that standing ovation. I appreciate that. <laughs> Now, in that introduction, it said that I was a spellbinding speaker that's going to keep you on the, uh, on the tip of your chair, so I want everybody to move forward. <laughs> <laughs> and today, we're going to be talking about something that's very important, something that is apropos, something is now, something that we need to understand, and that something is cancer. Now, is that going to bother anybody if we talk about cancer? All right. First of all, let's begin with some statistics, some very simple statistics that you can pick up almost any periodical or in the newspaper or any place else like that. Um, one of the first statistics that we hear about is one out of every four children born today will die of cancer. Now that's pretty startling, isn't it? Especially when you consider the fact that that statistic hasn't changed since 1956. And in fact, today, 60 million people one-fourth of the population right now is experiencing some type of cancer. But those statistics don't even fit this crowd. Right here, these, this group right here in this room, those statistics don't even fit this crowd. And in fact, we could solve the cancer problem right now if all we do is turn to the person sitting next to you and decide between the two of you which one of you will die of cancer. <laughs> uh, you're not willing to play that game, huh? No, some of you are going like this, right? <laughs> uh, to further emphasize that what I am saying is true, I would like to see a show of hands of those of you who have already experienced cancer, either personally or with a close loved one. Let's see a show of hands, and the rest of you turn around and look at the hands in the air, and you'll find that we are talking about 50% of this group right here. So you see, what we're talking about is something that doesn't happen to John or Mary or somebody else in another city. 
we're talking about something that's happening to us. We are the ones who are on the front line of this cancer war. And I think we need to know the enemy. And I think that's the first thing that anybody needs to do is to know and understand your enemy. So as a medical journalist, it is important for me to be as accurate as possible. In order to do this, I've brought with me several books. I've brought with me the book Medical Physiology, written by Dr. Arthur C. Guyton. Dr. Arthur C. Guyton is a medical doctor. He's also a family man. He has 12 children. Ten are medical doctors, the other two are dentists. They all use Dad's book. The next book uh, I'm going to be referring to would be Dr. Atkins' book, uh, Nutrition Breakthrough. Dr. Atkins is a medical doctor, actually rather famous in New York City. In fact, if you were to be in New York City and turn on the radio, you could probably hear him talk about the medical maladies of somebody else who has called in to ask questions. But I'm going to also refer to the American Cancer Society's cancer book. I think you can see that the information that we have is authoritative. And because of that, we are going to be able to search for the cancer answer. You know, when I began to write the book, The Cancer Answer, the title of the book was going to be In Search of the Cancer Answer. Because I felt that it was going to be a search to see how far we are or where we have to go in order to find the answer. By the time I had finished my research, we had shortened the title of the book to the cancer answer. And I don't mind telling you, on the front of the book, there are several statements. We're not being told the truth about cancer. Well, if we're not being told the truth, what is the truth? Cancer is not a disease, it's a natural occurring condition of the body. We haven't been told that. The answer to cancer has been staring the medical science in the face for at least a decade. And I will attempt to present a good case for their knowledge for this information. I'm sure the scientists know because I know. It is simply a matter of putting all the pieces together. My healthy cell concept does just that. So we are going to be talking about the healthy cell concept. In order to begin this then, the first thing we really need to do is find a definition of cancer. What does the cancer industry want us to believe cancer to be. To do that, let's go to the American Cancer Society's cancer book. You can pick up this, this book at B. Dalton Books or virtually any other bookstore. And it's written by oncologists to laymen. So this is what the oncologist would like you to believe cancer to be. And I'll read to you. Although most of us think of cancer as a single disease, it is actually a family of more than a hundred different types. Now, can you help me? What does that tell you about cancer? There's a lot of complicated. A lot of them? Complicated? Insidious. Insidious? Scary? Confusing? You see, this is what we're supposed to believe cancer to be. It also calls it a disease. And in fact, it doesn't call it one disease. How many does it talk about? a hundred different types of diseases. A whole family of diseases. All right, this is what we are led to believe, and this is what we've been told for the last 50 years, what cancer is. And in order for us to fight the cancer, we need money. Isn't that right? Mm -hmm. Please donate. This is what we are supposed to do. All right, I'm going to go to medical physiology. This is the book that is accepted by all medical doctors, chiropractors, nurses, veterinarians, and so on. And I'm going to turn to page 38. And uh, first of all, this page consists of over a thousand, or this book consists of over a thousand pages. And we are going to be talking about can you tell me what this big red word is right cancer. here? Cancer. Cancer. We are going to be talking about cancer. All right? And um, if this is over a thousand pages, and we have already found that cancer is a whole family of diseases over a hundred different types, how many pages in this book should be dedicated to the study of cancer? A hundred? 
500. 500. Okay, half the book. Well, cancer is ser very serious, don't you think? 500, though, that's, you need to study more things than just cancer when you're talking about human physiology. Could you tell me how many pages are dedicated to the study of cancer? Mm, just one. Just one. Part of, uh, part Which tells me that Dr. Arthur C. Guyton is not willing to put his medical credentials on the line and tell us all he knows about cancer, or perhaps he knows enough about cancer to do the whole job in one page. <laughs> well, let's find out. The first thing we need to do is we need to find out a definition according to Dr. Arthur C. Guyton. And that would be the very first paragraph of this particular subject. The very first sentence of the first paragraph reads, Cancer is caused in all instances by a mutation of cellular genes. Now, what does that tell us about cancer? It's a what? It's a mutation of cellular genes. You see, I can understand that. That's easy for me to understand. Cancer is caused in all instances by a mutation of cellular genes. Well then, how many of us have cells that are mutating? Well, we all do, don't we? We all do. And in fact, Dr. Arthur C. Guyton says this, yet despite all these precautions, probably one newly formed cell for every few million still has significant mutant characteristics. That means that every one of us have cells that are mutating. This body is made up of 75 trillion cells, so one out of every few million means that we've got a rather large population of mutant cells. Well, if we've got a large population of mutant cells and the definition of cancer according to this is cancer is caused in all instances by a mutation of cellular genes, why is it we're not all dying of cancer? What's that? Because we have an immune system. And in fact, Dr. Guyton agrees with you. In fact, he says this. Indeed, it is believed that all of us are continually forming cells that are continually cancerous. But that our immune system acts as a scavenger and nips these abnormal cells in the bud. Now, why are we not all dying of cancer? We've got an immune system. And what's its job? Very scientific. To nip the abnormal cells in the bud. Very scientific, all right? All right? So, we find then that we all have cells that are mutating. If cancer is simply caused by cells that are mutating, the reason we are not all dying of cancer right now is because we have an immune system. In other words, it's perfectly normal and natural to have an immune system. It's perfectly normal and natural to have a population of mutant cells. And it's perfectly normal and natural that the immune system has a simple job. And that job is to find the mutant cells and nip these abnormal cells in the bud. Now, that's easy to understand, isn't it? Now we've got a very confusing thing. How is it that you have one book that says cancer is a disease, and the other book doesn't even mention the word disease? One book says the cancer is caused, or cancer is a whole bunch of diseases, over a hundred different types of diseases, and the other one says that it is a single condition. Can both books be right? Well, as a medical journalist, I have to answer that question. Can both books be right? They can. The reason they can is the way the medical profession identifies conditions or diseases. Let me, show, let me see if I can show you how it happens. If I had a mutating cell and it was discovered in the bone, it would be called bone cancer. If it was found in the breast, it would be called breast cancer. If it was found in the colon, it would be called and found in the liver, it'd be called? Liver and it's found in the bloodstream, it's called? Leukemia. Leukemia. It's found in the lymphatic system, it's called? Lymphoma. Okay, lymphoma. Yeah. All right. So you see, we've already talked about five or six different diseases or cancers. In other words, cancers are not named by what they are. They are named by what they are perceived to be by the person on the outside looking in. 
Cancers are, are identified by the skin tissue from which it is made, how fast it is growing, what it looks like, where it is found, and the athlete that happened to have it at the time it was discovered, or the doctor who decided to name that particular one after him. You see? <laughs> and that is the way our cancers are named and classified. In other words, since we are made up of 75 trillion cells, and of the 75 trillion cells, we have over 200 different types of cells in this body. I could easily conceive of the idea, and I could accept the idea, that a person could say, well, we have over 200 different types of cells, or 200 different types of cancer, because we have over 200 different types of cells. Because the first thing a cancer cell will do is take on the characteristics of the cell from which it mutates. And then it takes on the characteristics of the mutation itself. So you see, both books are right if you understand how the medical profession classifies uh, diseases. However, I'm not willing to accept the idea that cancer is a disease. Not like mumps, measles, polio, or whooping cough, where it is something that's contagious. You can't catch cancer from anybody else. It's not contagious. It is not a, a bacteria or a virus that, uh, whose purpose it is to live inside the body and eat the nutrients that it finds or to destroy the body. You see, cancer is simply cells that were not constructed properly, making the, uh, the, a problem with the oncogenes or the genes inside the cells, and that they are simply loosely formed with no organized method of attack. Yet we hear the word attack when it, we hear about cancer, don't we? The cancer attacked something. It attacked the liver. It attacked the bones. Uh, we hear this almost as if cancer is supposed to be a, an instrument of death, a thing of danger, of destruction. When in fact, it's simply a bunch of confused cells that simply have not the capability of functioning. And they're just simply waiting around to be destroyed by the immune system. Now, we understand what cancer is, except that I'm not willing to accept the word disease. Let's name it as it really should be named. Except we've got a problem. The problem is that uh, if we're going to reclassify cancer, we've got to find somebody of authority who will reclassify cancer. Can we go to the medical profession and ask them to reclassify cancer? Why not? Good luck. Good luck. <laughs> Why not? It's a major. They've already classified it. They've already classified it. And they're satisfied with status quo, right? As long as they have us believing that cancer is a disease, then in order for us to get rid of cancer, we have to go to that authority that has the capability of getting rid of diseases. That's the medical profession. So we can't get the medical profession to reclassify cancer. Um, I know. Let's get a medical journalist. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'll volunteer. <laughs> I've stuck my neck out before, so I'll stick my neck out again, and I will reclassify cancer for you. But understand that if we reclassify cancer, it's got to fit in every situation. Ladies and gentlemen, let me suggest to you that cancer is not a disease, but it is a symptom of an inefficient immune system. You like that classification? Yes. Okay, now let's see, let's see if it works, okay? Let's see if it works. The first thing let's do is let's go back to the American Cancer Society's cancer book, and let's find out what they have to say on this subject. Listen carefully now. Only when the immune system is incapable of destroying these malignant cells will cancer develop. When is the only time you'll ever get cancer? When the immune system is down. Isn't that interesting? See, you've never thought of cancer as being that way because we haven't even been told the immune system had anything to do with cancer in the first place. This theory has been bolstered by what happens when the immune system breaks down as it does with patients with AIDS, several rare types of cancers such as Kapoli's sarcoma, Bruet's lymphoma, chronic myeloid leukemia are common among AIDS victims. So you see, uh, 
at the beginning, at least, it fits. Even the American Cancer Society indicates that the only time you ever have to worry about getting cancer is when the immune system is not doing its job. Hmm. Well, that's an interesting concept. Only when the immune system is not doing its job. Therefore, cancer is not a disease, it is a symptom of an inefficient immune system. Let's play on that for just a few minutes. The only time you'll ever get cancer is when the immune system is down, right? All right. Is it possible to weaken the immune system? Oh, of course, we know that. Okay, the next question is very, very important. Is it possible to strengthen the immune system? Yes. yes. Oh, very good. <laughs> now, let's put that into real life. Suppose a person goes in and has a checkup. The doctor come ba comes back with a frown on his face. He presents a, something that he has found. He says, you have cancer. He verifies it by the radiologist. He uh, verifies it with a blood test. He can even see it on the x-ray. There is no doubt in his mind that you have cancer. But the reason you have cancer is because your immune system is 10% less efficient than what it should be. This information scares you so much that you alter your lifestyle. You alter your lifestyle so that you actually become 15, or the immune system becomes 15% more efficient than what it was. What would happen to the cancer? Disappear. Because if your immune system becomes 15% more efficient than what it was, what would happen to the cancer? It disappear. And what would kill it? The immune system. Why? Because that's its job. And it knows its job. You see, we're talking about a part of the body that very few people understand. But every one of us need to understand it. In fact, I would like to share with you some of the lack of understanding we have and show you what has happened in the last few years. I'm going to Dr. Atkins' book, and on, in chapter 15 he talks about the immune system, and he brings us up to date, or he starts us out with what we understood cancer or the immune system to be just a few years ago. When I was a medical student, it took only a few days to learn all that was known in that time about this defense system within our bodies. In the last few years, there's been a veritable explosion of information dealing with every facet of, the, of our immune system. The issue I raise concerns the possibility that exercise and nutrition can enhance its effectiveness. As was true with early nutrition studies, the emphasis today has been on deficiencies. But what is now needed is to explore the nutrition and exercise augmentation of the immune system in the normal person. Uh, that is, the person that has no deficiencies. We are now at that dramatic point where this information is being gathered. When it is fully developed, it will constitute one of the greatest breakthroughs in exercise, nutrition, and medicine. Well, the question we have to ask now is, <laughs> when are we going to have that breakthrough? Because that's what Dr. Uh, Atkins is looking forward to. He's looking for a breakthrough. A breakthrough. And it'll be one of the greatest breakthroughs in exercise, nutrition, and medicine. Dr. Atkins talks about cancer now in chapter 17. And it's very logical. Keep in mind, Dr. Atkins is a medical doctor. And this is what he says. The matchup of what we know about our immunity with what we know about cancer holds hope of providing answers we have all been seeking. The question raised is a tantalizing one. If the body's immune system helps to control cancer, then is it not lo logical that the true breakthrough against cancer may be found in strengthening our immunity factors? Well, gee, we're talking about a very logical way to overcome cancer. All we have to do is to strengthen our immune system. We know that if the immune system is down, we're subject to cancer. So all we have to do is improve the immune system. Well, there are several things we need to do. The first thing we need to do is understand what in the world the immune system is. Well, 
We can go to several sources because we have a number of sources, such as Time Magazine. Oh, yeah. Time Magazine talks about the battle inside your body, and it talks about the immune system or the white blood cells. And it's a terrific article, but I doubt that too many people saw it. Or we can go to U.S. News, front page, The Body at War. And it also talks about the amazing immune system. You see, we're getting more and more information about this immune system that is actually becoming available to us from various sources. But I'm going to try, try to present to you the immune system in a thumbnail sketch. All right? First of all, understand that the immune system is extremely intelligent. In fact, one of the oncologists in the Time magazine makes a statement about how intelligent the immune system is. The immune system is compared favorably with the most complex organ of them all, the brain. The immune system has the phenomenal ability for dealing with information, for learning and memory, and creating and storing and using information. So we find this immune system is actually very intelligent. And to help you understand how intelligent it is, uh, I need to become very, very personal with somebody here. Can I get, become personal with you? Okay. <laughs> okay. We've got a lot of uh, people he around here, so I'm going to ask you some very important questions. The first question. How did you begin your life? I mean, nine months before you were born. As a cell. As a cell, all right. And immediately as a cell, as you begin your life, you had within the cell the DNA, the deoxyribonucleic acid, the blueprint of your body. And already established on, in that single cell, right after the egg and the sperm got together, already established was the color of your hair, the color of your eyes, how tall you're going to be, how big the femur was going to be, the largest bone in your body, and how big the smallest bone, the stirrup in the inner ear was going to be. Already how to handle protein and what to do with carbohydrates and how to digest food. Already how to laugh, sneeze, cry, and a lot of other things we simply take for granted. That information was already recorded in one single DNA of the single cell. Now, when the cell divided for the first time, which of the two cells were the smartest? They are both the same, right? Yeah. They're both the same because both of them had the very same blueprint of the entire body. And when they divided the f uh, second time, so that you had four cells, which of the four cells was the dumbest? None of them. Once again, can you see the direction we're going? Uh -huh. right. Because this happened over and over and over again, so that 11 months later, you were a complete organism already through birth, and already on your way to become the entity that you're supposed to become. 75 trillion cells in number, and all of them are just as intelligent as you were at the moment of conception. That's very intelligent. In fact, Dr. Carl Sagan makes a statement that if all of the information recorded in one DNA molecule was translated into English, you'd have enough information to fill 4,000 volumes of a book as thick as the Bible. That's a lot of information, you see. Now, we then study the immune system. How big is the immune system? Well, the immune system is basically 1% of the body. 1% of the body is dedicated to civil defense. <laughs> In other words, if you are a 200 pound person, you've got a two pound army of lymphocytes running around trying to find those things that do not belong in the body and doing something with it. Getting rid of it, you see. Well, when you understand that it's a two pound army of lymphocytes, all screwing around, all very, very intelligent and all understanding cancer, then you can understand how amazing this immune system is. You know, when I wrote the book, uh, The Cancer Answer, I had some help. I had some help from my co-author, Larry Lymphocyte. 
<laughs> Some of you laugh. <laughs> Some of you know what a lymphocyte is. Larry, a lymphocyte is a white blood cell. Very intelligent, I might add. He had some problems, technical problems. He could not type. He wasn't <laughs> big enough to push down the keys. You see. <laughs> that's where I came in. But he did understand cancer because that's his job. So Larry Lymphocyte informed me of what cancer is all about. Now, I would like to introduce you to my co-author, Larry Lymphocyte, except now I've got some technical problems. One is that if I was to bring him up in front right here, you would not see him because he's too small. Secondly, you wouldn't hear him because he doesn't have a voice. But I did capture him on videotape. So this time, I would like you to introduce you to my co-author, Larry, the lymphocyte. we have here a cell that's doing what all cells know how to do, uh, something we still don't know how to do, and that's to multiply by dividing. We haven't been able to figure out how to do that. We either have to multiply or we have to divide. This cell has just been fertilized, and it is going to go through what is known as the dance of life. Or it will divide the first time, and right after that it will divide again. Each time it will duplicate itself. In order to, for it to duplicate itself, it's got to duplicate the, the blueprint of the entire body. This is a process that takes 11 months from the time of conception until you have the full count of 75 trillion cells. This is a rather amazing thing when you consider the fact that it is actually very, very accurate. Only one out of every few million are mutant. The rest are accurate. The rest have the DNA. This is the DNA. It's a, uh, a long spiral staircase, nucleotides, a nucleoprotein um, configuration. Uh, and the first thing that happens before a cell can divide, this has to actually divide. But in, if it was to divide in half, it only have half the information to pass on. So you have nucleotides on the inside of the nucleus that attach themselves in proper sequence to the DNA so that by the time the DNA finishes its division, instead of dividing in half, it is actually divided in two. This, ladies and gentlemen, is my co-author, Larry, the lymphocyte. Notice that he has the capability of changing direction. There has to be some type of thought process going on, regardless of how minute it is. And notice also he is very friendly to the red blood cells, but he's not too friendly to that metabolic garbage that he just found. He simply stops and has lunch. He gets rid of the metabolic garbage. So we find that Larry has the responsibility of keeping things clean, tidy. There's a little bit of bacteria there, a little streptococcus, and he surrounds the streptococcus and begins to get rid of it by ingestation. Ladies and gentlemen, you're watching the original Pac-Man. <laughs> this is a, this dark area is a cell that's going to die. You see, another responsibility that Larry has is to keep, uh, get rid of the dead cells so it doesn't build up garbage on the inside. Um, it's surrounded by white blood cells, but the white blood cells don't pay any attention to it until it dies. Now watch what happens to the white blood cells. See, nobody has to tell them their job. They simply get in and start doing what they're supposed to do, and that is to get rid of the dead cells. This is a process or a function of the white blood cells that has to happen that if it, in fact, it didn't happen, that you would be completely choked up within just a couple of months, and you would not be able to continue to, to live. What's that? Do they, how do they like expel what they they expel, it, uh, they expel the waste, but it becomes the uh, amino acids and the basic concepts of the body. And some of it is used, again, by the body. This cell is going to die, or going to divide, but instead of dividing in uh, two, it divides in four. This is actually a cancer cell. 
two of the cells fail to separate. Therefore, you're going to have one cell with two nuclei. By the time we put our cameras in on these guys, we found that two lymphocytes had already found their way into the cancer cell, and you have another cell on the outside surface trying to break through the surface to get into the other two lymphocytes. We could learn a lot from this little guy. He tries once, backs up, and tries again, backs up, tries again. He doesn't give up. We counted about six or seven times that it actually charged the cell membrane trying to break through. And finally, there's the breakthrough. Now you have three lymphocytes inside one cancer cell, and the cancer cell is going to be destroyed. This is cancer tissue. The fast-moving cells on the inside are lymphocytes. And they're moving around and, and scurrying around and killing or dis, uh, poisoning the cancer tissue, and the cancer tissue dies. That was so much fun. Let's watch that one again. Cancer tissue. You have two lymphocytes moving around, destroying cancer tissue by poisoning them, and the cancer can't handle it anymore, and there is the total and complete destruction of the cancer. Now, isn't that exciting? <laughs> Was that the cell membrane breaking down you saw there? Is it look like fluid? Yeah, that was the, ca that was the entire cancer tissue uh, of thousands of cells, and you had two cells on the inside. The two uh, cells on the inside are cytotoxic T cells, or they're known as killer cells. They have the capability of going out and destroying the cancer cells, and they have a little potion. The little potion is actually injected into the cancer cells, and the cancer cells can't handle that little potion. That little potion is manufactured inside the lymphocytes themselves. That potion is known as hydrogen peroxide. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> so you see, we no longer have to question whether or not the immune system has the capability of destroying cancer. It can be vastly outnumbered, and it can actually destroy the cancer. So no longer do we have to even really be concerned about what we call cancer what it's named, or where it is, or what it is doing inside the body. If the immune system is down, it's entirely possible that the cancer, or that the body could develop several different types of cancer, because whatever condition allows one cancer to occur, will also allow other cancers to occur in the very same body. But this is a medical fact, that cancer cannot exist in the body that has an efficient immune system. So rather than trying to attack the cancer, let's figure out how to strengthen the immune system. Now, does that sound reasonable, logical? Dr. Atkins has very poignant things to say about this particular subject. Um, and I'd like to read that to you, but, but I'd like to set it up first. What I would like to do is give you a brief history of the cancer industry. Now, I'm not going to go back all the way through the cancer industry. Let's start in 1971. That was the year President Nixon was President of the United States. And as President of the United States, President Nixon received a visit from three oncologists. The administrator of Sloan Kettering, the administrator of the Mayo Clinics, and the administrator of the National Cancer Institute the three top oncologists in the nation at that time. They approached President Nixon and said, President, if you'll give us the amount of money we use for putting a man on the moon, we promise you that we'll have the cancer answer by 1975. That's a good promise. President Nixon shrugged his shoulders and said, Gentlemen, I cannot give you the money because I'm, the, I'm only the President of the United States. In order to get that kind of money, you have to go uh, develop a bill. You've got to allow it to go through Congress, and they've got to act upon it. And at that, one of the oncologists said, President, you can give us that money. You see, as president, you have an executive privilege. You have the authority to declare war on any foreign invader. We did that to Japan. And if Canada was to come across the border, you could do that today. With that, President Nixon signed a bill, or actually declared war, on cancer. 
and provided a $1.5 billion war chest. Then he turned to the American public and he said, we have declared war on cancer and we want you to participate. Now, did we participate? <laughs> you bet we did. We red-blooded Americans, we participated. We matched funds. We came up with another $1.5 billion of donated money. That's $3 billion and that was just the catalyst needed to establish the cancer industry. Immediately, we find that people got involved. Insurance companies begin to write what is known as major medical policies to cover the exposure of major cancer problems. The pharmaceutical organizations got involved and they begin to develop what are known now as chemotherapeutic drugs. Over 500 drugs were submitted to the Food and Drug Administration for licensing or for licensing for the AMA. Of the 500 drugs, 40 of them qualify. And by their very definition, every chemotherapeutic drug has to be carcinogenic because every chemotherapeutic drug either attacks the cell membrane to destroy this, uh, the fastest growing cell of the body or it attacks the DNA which causes a mutation. And that is basically what a chemotherapeutic drug is. So today we do have a cancer industry. Today the cancer industry is an 80 billion dollar a year industry. There are no, more people employed by the cancer industry than those who are known to have cancer. In other words, there are more people living on cancer than dying of it. Now, do you begin to feel a little something right now? I, I hope so, because <laughs> this is the way I felt as I was doing this research. I couldn't figure out why we didn't have a whole bunch of people going towards strengthening the immune system. Let me show you how simple that is. And Dr. Atkins agrees with this. He says, although cancers should not be in the body, and we all agree with that, although cancers should not be in the body, they are not foreign objects. Therefore, the war on cancer is illegal. They're made of tissue, they're grown by the body itself, thus it is possible the cancer represents a condition. Notice it's been reduced from a disease to a condition. Cancer represents a condition in which the host's defenses are weakened, a condition in which the balance of power between the host's resistance and the condition process is tipped in favor of the condition. It is not logical to weaken the patient further with radiation, chemotherapy, and surgery. But rather, cancer treatment should begin by augmenting the victim's resistance so that he can ward off the inroads of the runaway cancer cells. Most of the strengthening comes under the heading of immunology. And this type of treatment has been almost uniformly suppressed. Now when I say almost uniformly suppressed, I can tell you, except for very few places, immunology is unheard of. I'm thinking of a gentleman. His name is Alan Rosen. He developed bone cancer when he was 24 years old. He went to the doctor and the doctor said, well, in order to save your life, I'm going to have to, you're going to have to lose your leg. He finally decided that, well, if that's the case, we'll lose the leg, save the man. He lost his leg just below the knee, and for the next seven years, he went through hell. We're talking about chemotherapy, radiation, surgery. We're talking about losing his head, losing his mind, practically losing his wife, losing his job, losing his standard of living. And for the next seven years, they used him in virtually every type of chemotherapeutic activity. Finally, after seven years, he went to the doctor again because he wasn't feeling too well. The doctor took an x-ray and came back and showed him the x-ray, and the x-ray showed that he had bone cancer throughout his entire body. The doctor said he lit up like a Christmas tree. 
and he said, I think you've only got about three weeks to live. With that, Alan Rosen got on the telephone and he began to call all over the United States. He wanted to donate the last three weeks of his life to some scientific organization with the possibility that whatever they found out about him, that they could help somebody else who might have bone cancer. He met a Dr. Juilliard, not a medical doctor, a scientist, not even a member of the United States, but he works at UCLA Medical School in the basement. He talked to Dr. Juilliard over the phone and the Dr. Juilliard said, I can't even touch you. I'm a scientist, not a medical doctor. I can't touch you because you're not released from your doctor. Alan Rosen got into his car, drove over to his medical doctor and got a release from his medical doctor, went with his entire portfolio, all of the information he could get from the medical doctor, to Dr. Juilliard. Dr. Juilliard studied his case took a sample of his immune system, took a sample of the bone or the cancer, and then in the next 24 hours, he took this information and put them in petri dishes in a laboratory, and I guess proceeded to carry on a little bit of wars inside this laboratory. The next day, he invited Alan Rosen in and he re-injected his immune system into the heel of his foot. And he told Alan Rosen that within 24 hours, he would be feeling better. 24 hours, he was feeling better. There were no side effects, nothing that he had experienced before. And 48 hours, he's feeling even better than that. And in fact, he continued to feel better and better and better. And four months later, they could not find cancer in his body. You see, Dr. Juilliard is an immunologist. Dr. Juilliard can't receive a grant from the National Cancer Institute. He cannot. He cannot. They won't give it to him. He only receives money from people that know what he's doing. And in fact, his cure rate is 40%. His cure rate is 40%. He's not even a medical doctor. He is a scientist, an immunologist. And the only people he ever sees are the people who have already been classified as terminally ill and have less than a month to live. Still, he has a cure rate of 40%. You see, can you see the difference between an immunologist and the cancer industry? Um, The term war on cancer is more than just rhetoric. Cancers are treated as many physicians treat diseases. There is an invader that must be attacked, removed, or in some way killed. Don't worry about how sick the treatment makes the person with cancer. Kill the cancer, forget about the rest. This reasoning borders on irrational. For chemotherapies and radiation cause so many diverse systemic effects that the patients sometimes die of the side effects rather than the tumors themselves. Chemotherapeutic agents, by their very nature, are cellular poisons. How can they do the recipient much good? Now, what would happen if the medical profession said, King's Epsks, <laughs> we've known what cancer is all the time. Um, we decided to fess up. If the medical establishment recognized nutrition and exercise as a better way of dealing with cancer, I think it would become obvious that nutrition and exercise should be able to counter most other diseases. And what then? The entire pharmaceutical industry would come crashing down. Nobody would be willing to trust drugs anymore, and everyone would rely upon nutrition and exercise techniques in most illnesses. The leadership of the drug industry, the American Cancer Society, the AMA, and other medical groups would be threatened with extinction. There would be lobbyists and politicians displaced and out of work. In short, there would be widespread disorder and havoc in the many business community. And we wouldn't want that, would we? <laughs> I am glad Dr. Atkins made that statement. You see, as a medical journalist, I can quote him. Now, it would be great if somehow 
we could have some scientists come out and tell us what cancer really is. Well, we do. We do. And in fact, in October of 1989, it happened. October 1989, we have two people win the Nobel Prize in medicine. University of California, San Francisco researchers win the Nobel Prize in medicine. Why did they win the Nobel Prize? Listen carefully. Cancer was once thought to be a bewildering variety of diseases with too many causes to count. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> That's what we're told today, right? But Bishop and Varamas found that the oncogenes are the single unifying explanation of how cancers occur. It's almost as if these two esteemed, esteemed scientists read my book, The Cancer Answer, and then won the Nobel Prize. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be great if I could say that, but I can't say that. You see, they won the Nobel Prize from information that they had published in the medical journals in 1976. Thirteen years ago. My father told me never to tear anything down unless I had something better to build in its place. <laughs> We've been talking about a cancer. The question we have to ask is, are we talking about the cancer on the inside or on the outside? And I think we've identified both. I would like to help you, or help you understand, how we can simply solve this problem. And it's actually very simple. In order to solve the problem, we have what is known as the healthy cell concept. The first time the healthy cell concept was presented was in an airplane when I was flying over Chicago O'Hara Airport. I was in one of those airplanes that didn't know how to land. Have you ever been in one of those? <laughs> We were just orbiting. And I didn't know if we were going to land today or the next day. The person sitting next to me was just as bored about the flight as I was. And come to find out that he was a medical doctor. And we began to talk back and forth. And this is the conversation. Um, what do you do for a living? Oh, I'm a medical journalist. Oh? Well, what do you write about? <laughs> I write about health. How can you be a medical journalist and write about health? Simple. <laughs> I pulled out a napkin, took my pen out of my pocket, and I drew a circle on the napkin. And then I entitled it, Healthy cell. And then I turn to the doctor and I says, Doctor, you're made up of 75 trillion cells. He says, I know that. I said, if all of the cells of your body were healthy, what would you be? He said, out of work. <laughs> he had a sense of humor. <laughs> and then we got serious about this. If all of the cells of your body were healthy, what would you be? Healthy. 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 All right, very good. He says, well, Al, you're making something that is very, very complicated, too simplistic. I says, no, quite the contrary, doctor. You're making something that's very simple, too complicated. <laughs> Obviously, you could tell that we were not going to agree on that airplane flight. <laughs> but we actually had agreed to, although we, we were going to disagree, we weren't going to be disagreeable. And so we also knew that we were not going to be bored the rest of the flight. <laughs> he said, well, how do you propose we help the cells to become healthy? I says, Doctor, there's only four things that we humans can do to help the cells to become healthy. He says, well, what are those? And I says, I thought you'd never ask. <laughs> and I quartered the paper like this so I could talk about each one of them individually. And the first thing I began to talk about was cell communication. He looked at that and laughed. He says, cell communication. You mean to tell me you're going to try to talk to the cells? 
And I smiled back at him and I said, Doctor, I've got one cell writing a book right now. <laughs> he didn't know what I was talking about. But you see, cells have the ability to communicate. That is part of life. That in fact, that's the very definition of life. That's the essence of life. Cells have the ability to communicate. Anything that's live can communicate. Anything that's dead does not communicate. Rocks are dead, they don't communicate. Cells are alive, they communicate. Even plant cells have the ability to communicate. I said, remember doctor, when the scientists took a plant and connected it up electronically so it could measure the amount of electrical activity going on inside the plant while it was growing? He says, yes, I remember that. I says, do you remember when that particular scientist went into that room and proceeded to kill a mouse in front of the plant? And remember what happened to the plant? He says, yes. The plant registered a greater amount of electrical activity. I said, and not only that, but every time that particular scientist went into that particular room with that particular plant, that plant registered a great amount of activity. In other words, the scientist had taught that plant how to fear mankind. Which gives me a better excuse why I shouldn't be mowing my lawn, right? <laughs> I'll jump at any excuses for that. <laughs> but you see, plant cells have the ability to communicate. And they understand what's going on. Now, it's hard to understand, but it's easy for us to comprehend how we can actually pick up a telephone and talk to somebody in Australia, you see. That we understand. Or we turn on the television and we can see what's happening over in uh, Kuwait. You see, those things we accept. But we have a hard time accepting the idea that these very, very intelligent cells are carrying on com conversations at all time. When in fact, our scientists are beginning to understand that. Our scientists are, uh, have identified several of the communicators. Not only do the cells uh, communicate through the neurological activities or the telephone lines of the body, the nerves, but they have the ability to communicate by chemicals. For example, what is interferon? We've heard about it, haven't we? From the brain. Interferon is a chemical giving off by one part of the body to tell another part of the body what to do. What about insulin? That's an easy one to understand. And once again, it's given off by an organ to tell the other, another part of the body what to do and how to do it. Do you know our scientists have picked up on several other cell communicators such as interleukin-2. Have you heard of interleukin-2? Interleukin-2 is a a chemical. It's given off by a macrophage. A macrophage is a great big huge white blood cell and it goes to the bone marrow to tell the bone marrow how many neutrophils to manufacture. Neutrophils are little tiny white blood cells. And it not only tells it where to go or what, how many to manufacture but where the battle is and how to come prepared to fight the battle. Do you know our scientists have found interleukin 2, interleukin 3, interleukin 4, interleukin 5 right on up into interleukin 9. And all of these interleukins or cell communicators are what our cells are using, our white blood cells are using to communicate with other parts of the body. And in fact, the more we understand this, the more prepared we are to help them carry on their battle. Well, the rather amazing thing is that our scientists are beginning to recognize that the cells understand English. We don't have to learn their language. They understand English. Well, that's hard to understand, except that one of the worst things a person can be told is you have cancer. You have cancer of the liver. 95% of all people diagnosed of having cancer of the liver are dead within six months. So what I want you to do is I want you to go home I want you to prepare your husband. I want you to prepare, prepare your family. I want you to prepare your will, and I want you to prepare to die. How many cells just heard that message? All of them. Do you know that cells respect authority? And can you imagine the rumors that are going on inside the body right now? Hey, did you hear what they said? That guy is a, an authority, and did you hear what he's told us? He said that this factory is shutting down in six months. What are you going to do about it? Well, some of them will go like this. I'm going to fight to the bitter end. Others will say, oh my goodness, if the factory is going to be shut down, I'm out of a job. 
in six months, I am going to go on strike. The effects of stress on the immune functions was studied in a group of hospitalized depressed patients in non-depressed controls. A 50% reduction in the activity of the killer cells was found in both the depressed patients and in the control subjects who were experiencing chronic emotional stress. Now let's go back to the definition of cancer. Cancer is a symptom of an inefficient immune system, meaning that the immune system is not really doing what it's supposed to be doing in the first place. And suddenly, the body is told, the cells are told, that you've got cancer and that the factory is shutting down in six, in, uh, six months. Half of the cells go on strike. They simply shut down. They forget to function. They no longer are working. They're no longer energetic. Well, if the immune system is already uh, having problems, and then 50% of the white blood cells that are available no longer work, it's a little wonder why a person doesn't die six months later. But it is a self-fulfilling prophecy and it's the medical doctor that caused the death by saying, you're going to die in six months. You see, that happened to my mother. I was there. I was in the oncologist's office listening to him tell her that she was going to die in six months because she had cancer of the liver. We knew she had cancer of the liver. We could feel it. It was as big as a softball right there. And the doctor says, you've got cancer of the liver. You're going to die in six months. Do you know that 18 months later, we were in Hawaii snorkeling? <laughs> the doctor who pronounced her death sentence died six months later. <laughs> cancer. <laughs> oh my goodness, what are we talking about? Do you know that Norman Cousins, a medical journalist, has this to say on the subject. Current studies show that serious diagnosis can cause a patient to panic or to lapse into hopelessness and depression. We know too that such reactions can interfere with a treatment and impair the immune system whose effectiveness is vital, especially in, combining the, uh, in combating the threatening disease. Now listen to this. American people somewhere along the way have been misinformed on how to interpret their own body's information. We have separated ourselves from the essential knowledge about the working of the human body, unaware of the resources waiting to be put to use. Now, you see our scientists are beginning to study cell communication, they call it psychoimmunity, or psychoneurological immunity, depending on how many letters of the alphabet you want to put in the name. Uh, psychoneurological immunity is simply where you imagine the white blood cells being knights in shining armor, and the dragon, or the cancer, is out there. And every morning you visualize the knights in shining armor going out and fighting the dragon. And they found that the dragon, or the cancer, just slowly disappears known as psychoimmunity. You simply tell the cells what you want them to do. But is this new? No. no. It's just called by different names, isn't it? What about the term faith healing? How about prayer? When you say, Dear Lord, help me to be healthy. How many cells just heard that message? All of them. All of them. And you know, the most important thing that anybody can do is get up in the morning and look at yourself in the mirror and say, I am healthy, I am happy. Because all of the cells heard that. And when they get that message, they in turn say, hey, <laughs> we're healthy, we're happy, let's continue doing what we're supposed to do. And they continue to keep the body healthy the way it's supposed to. Cell communication is real. And it doesn't make any difference what you call it. It has worked over and over and over again and many, many times it has worked and it will continue to work. All we have to do is learn how to use it. Cell communication is real. 
The next part of the cell, uh, healthy cell concept is cell environment. Oh my goodness, cell environment. What, is, what do we mean by cell environment? Well, the best way to get to this is, what do we mean by people environment? There's a difference between cell environment and people environment. People environment happens to be air, gas. That's what we live in. Our environment is air. Okay, and we're concerned about the pollution of the air. What do we mean by cell environment? What do cells live in? Fluid. What does it live in? Fluid. Fluid. Yep. Right. Some people have to tried to tell us that the cells live in blood. Cells do not live in blood. You've only got about five to eight pints of blood in your body, and it's only found in one place, and that's inside the cardiovascular system, which is a closed circuit system. The blood never reaches the cells of the body. It only carries the oxygen and nutrients to the capillaries where the oxygen and nutrients escapes through sieve-like holes into the lymph fluid. You've got three times as much lymph fluid in the body as the blood, and the lymph fluid surrounds all of the cells. All of the cells of the body depend upon the circulation of this lymph fluid. This is the water. We like to think of this as an aquarium. We call it an aquarium rather than an ocean because an ocean is happenstance. An aquarium is highly controlled. You've got thousands of control mechanisms inside the body. These control mechanisms make sure the temperature is at the right 98.6. The pH balance is just right. Uh, the glucose is just where it's supposed to be. Who controls all of this control mechanisms? No, we don't. <laughs> We're not smart enough. We don't have enough information. The cells control these control mechanisms. You see, when you were first born, you didn't have to think, now wait, I have just been born into this brand new world, my temperature is 98.6, so therefore I had better, you see. You didn't even have to worry about that, because that is something that was automatic. The cells were extremely intelligent, and they kept the temperature at 98.6, and they kept everything else the way they're supposed to uh, keep them. So you see, we rely upon the intelligence of these cells in what they're doing. Actually, we only have one thing that we have to do when we're talking about cell environment. All we have to do is replace the water that leaks out of the aquarium. <laughs> That's all. And we lose from five to eight cups of water a day. We lose water through the urine, through sweat, and through breathing. And so all we have to do is replace the water with pure water. That's all we have to do, with pure water. Do you know? Ladies and gentlemen, we are failing miserable at this very simple task. Because we don't replace the water with pure water. I could talk about the insecticides and pesticides that accidentally get into the water. Or I could talk about the industrial waste that constantly goes into the water. Or I could talk about the spills and a few other things like this. But I don't want to talk about those things because those things are accidental. What I want to talk about are those things that we humans are putting into the water on purpose. We're talking about premeditated, you see. There are a couple of chemicals that we're putting into the water on purpose. Can you think of any of these chemicals we are actually putting into the water on purpose? Chlorine. 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 All right, chlorine. Of course we're putting chlorine in the water, aren't we? I mean, why do we put chlorine in the water in the first place? To kill bacteria, right? What's bacteria? Cells. Cells. So we know that chlorine is a known cell killer. We're not denying this at all. Chlorine is a known cell killer. In fact, it is so good as a cell killer. What did we use in the First World War to get rid of our enemies? Chlorine, chlorine gas. Did it work? It sure did. It worked so well that we passed an international law at the Geneva Convention telling all of our enemies that it was illegal to kill an American citizen with chlorine gas. No fair. You can use bombs, bullets, and hand grenades. That's fair. <laughs> you cannot use chlorine gas. We'd rather do that ourselves. <laughs> so what do we put into our swimming pools before we dive in? Chlorine, chlorine of course. And what does it do to the hair on our head? <laughs> <laughs> Destroys it, right? What about the skin tissue, the delicate skin tissue of the eyes? What does it do to those? just destroys the eyes, the skin tissue of the eyes. And what about the outside surface of the body? Yeah, it dries it up, kills the cells. You see, that's what's happening. Tell me, does the killing stop at the lips? 
No. So every time you drink chlorinated water, what are you doing to the cells inside the body? Destroying, Destroying them. On purpose, premeditated. Tell me, ladies and gentlemen, who has the responsibility of getting rid of dead cells? Larry Lymphocyte, right? Hey, I thought Larry Lymphocyte's job was to get rid of the mutant cells. But you see, we drink chlorinated water day in and day out. And we're killing the cells inside the body. And it's Larry's responsibility to get rid of the dead cells. Do you suppose that we're actually overworking this poor guy? Yeah. And do you suppose that is the reason every municipality that has chlorine in their drinking water has an increase in incidence of cancer by 20%? Can you see what we're doing? We are our own worst enemy. And to make things even worse, we're compounding the entire problem. Because we don't stop at just one chemical, do we? <laughs> we have another one. And what is that one? Fluoride. fluoride. Now, I'm going to expose some things about fluoride. Contrary to popular belief, let's identify fluoride for just a few minutes. First of all, why have we been told we have fluoride in the drinking water? Prevent tooth, Prevent tooth decay. You were, we were told that too, right? Yes. So was I. <laughs> what is fluoride? Why do we have it in the drinking water? You know, this one was really confusing to me because when I began to study fluoride and I found out how insidious the poison was, I couldn't imagine how scientists in their right mind or even in their wrong mind could even figure out why you would put fluoride in the drinking water. Well, let's see. The first thing we have to do is we have to go to a group of people who are convinced that fluoride is good for us. This is published by the American Dental Association. All right? And the title of this is Fluoride Helps Prevent Tooth Decay. So this is what they would have us believe. I'll open it up and I'll read several things from this simple brochure. Today, more than 120 million people, representing over 50% of the population, are served by fluoridated water supplies in the United States. 50% of the people in the United States have fluoridated water in their water supplies. Congratulations, they've done a good job. Now, as a medical journalist, I want to find out what fluoride really is. So, I am going to go to resources. How about Medical Physiology? It's a book that all dentists have in their library. Let's open it up to where we can find fluoride. You do that by opening up the index, finding the word fluoride, and then opening it up, and you find that it talks about fluoride. All right. I am going to read several statements to see if the propaganda on this piece of literature agrees with what they can get out of this book. Fluoride is also a natural component of tooth enamel and bone. In other words, fluoride is something that's necessary. It's part of metabolism, right? Fluoride does not seem to be a necessary element for metabolism. Hmm. Well, fluoride helps teeth become more resilient to decay by strengthening tooth enamel. <laughs> fluoride does not make the teeth themselves stronger. There is also evidence that fluoride strengthens the bones and thus may help to prevent such degenerative diseases as osteoporosis. It has nothing to do with uh, teeth, but osteoporosis. Excessive intake of fluorine causes fluorosis, which is manifest in the mild state by mottled teeth and in a more severe state by enlarged bones. Oh, hey, as a medical journalist, I just can't accept that. I mean, this too many things that are too far off the wall. I've got to go to another source. How about the Townsend Newsletter, May 1990? Just recent information. This is a letter from doctors communicating with doctors. All right? The National Toxology Program, now that sounds pretty good, study fact sheet dated January 22, 1990, recent, uh, under the auspices of the United States Public Health Service. Good has linked fluoride to fluorosis and cancer. Hmm. 
1985 Procter & Gamble report. They've got a vested interest in this. Obtained October 4th, 1989 from the Department of Health and Human Services also links fluoride to cancer. Hmm. John R. Lee, medical doctor, says the strength of the fluoride cancer link is greater than that which resulted in the banning of all our red dye number three or cyclamate. David Kennedy, DDS, San Diego, California, says fluorides do not reduce tooth decay. Is he the only one? Dr. Hardwick and D.M. Bunting of Turner Dental School says the changes in the number of lesions or cavities were not significant in one or two parts per million of fluoride supplementation. Why do we have fluoride in the water if it isn't working? Canada, the, the areas which report the lowest incidence in decay are the unfluoridated areas. I'm beginning to smell a rat. The National Institute of Dental Research found no difference in the incidence of tooth decay in children 5 through 17 raised in non-fluoridated, partially fluoridated, or fluoridated communities. Well, you and I know that we don't have as many tooth decays now as we did years ago. Other researchers have found the reduction in tooth decay to be closely related to the occupation and educational level of the parents. In other words, if mom says, Johnny, brush your teeth, he doesn't have tooth decays, right? My goodness. Let's go to the ultimate authority. <laughs> Webster's Dictionary. <laughs> Fluoride. A corrosive, poisonous, greenish, yellow, gaseous chemical element the most reactive non-metallic element known in forming fluorides with almost all other known elements. Now, as a medical journalist, I like to dig. I have to find out the whole story of fluoride. Why is it in our drinking water? And this is also included in the book, The Cancer Answer. And I find that in 1931, there was a gentleman that it was employed by the American Can Company and Anaconda Aluminum Company to fi try to figure out how to get rid of a byproduct of the aluminum industry. His job was to figure out how to get rid of 50,000 tons of fluoride a year. He couldn't do it. Not until 1938. In 1939, the, 1938, this very same gentleman was employed by the Department of Health, the United States government. And so at that time, he says, hey, do you know that although the teeth might become slightly mottled or discolored, that if you put fluoride in the drinking water, that it is entirely possible that we could reduce the amount of cavities? Do you know he sold that to the American government? Yeah. He just made that. I guess so. <laughs> or that's what I used to believe. He just made it up. But the rather amazing thing is that we are all so gullible that even the scientists, even the medical doctors, even the dentists, all of us accepted the idea that fluoride in the drinking water is going to somehow help us with our teeth. And now, do you know the aluminum industry no longer has to figure out how to get rid of 50,000 tons of fluoride a year? They sell it to the municipalities. Now, all of these things are st you still have something that I, that's missing. Something is missing. Why are we so gullible? Why didn't our scientists put a stop to it? Why did the medical doctors or the dentists accept it? Why is it something that we have? Why are we drinking fluoridated water? And I think I came up with the answer. I'm going to read something to you. Something that shocked me. Listen carefully. Sugar, salt, tobacco, aluminum, and fluoridated water over a period of years with perhaps other slow poisons will help to ensure that they expire before they retire. If there were fewer people bidding against each other, 
money or credit would keep its value. That's taken out of Keeping Our Money Healthy, published by the Federal Reserve Bank, New York City. We are drinking chlorinated water. Why? Because it has been put there on purpose by a consortium of banks whose desire it is to control the masses, not only of the United States, but of the entire world. Some of you might know this as the Illuminati. You might have heard that before. And there's some other startling things that I would like to present to you. I don't have time right now, but stick around afterwards, and I'll present some other startling things to you. All right, so now we find that we can no longer depend upon the municipality to supply good water. They're not going to do it. We find what we need to do is we need to protect ourselves. There are two sources of pure water that I know of. One is fresh fruits and vegetables. If you can get the fresh fruits and vegetables, the water inside the fr fresh fruits and vegetables is pure water. The other source would be to uh, secure a water purification system in your own home. Now, let me give you some advice. Some of you are depending upon bottled water for your water, for your good water. If you're depending on bottled water, do not uh, depend on bottled water that uh, is delivered to you in plastic containers. The reason you don't want to depend on the plastic container is within eight hours after water has been put into the plastic container at room temperature, and that's where most of the water is found, the sunlight going through the clear plastic causes a chemical reaction between the H2O and the plastic so that it leaches out of the plastic a carcinogen. So that is in the water. And anytime you pick up a plastic container and drink it, and if you can taste plastic, what you're, not, what you're tasting is not the plastic, you're tasting the carcinogen, and the tongue uh, is telling you, don't drink it. All right? So if you're going after bottled water, only go after the bottled water that is bottled in glass. Our scientists don't use plastic for the, their chemical studies, right? Because they react. Don't you use your plastic for storing your water. Go for a water purification system. You're going to find that you are going to need it. This year, you need it. Next year, you're going to need it worse. And the year after that, it's going to need it worse. And it's going to get worse rather than better. Go after a water purification system, one that you can control so that you can control the water in your own home. You need it. The next part of the healthy cell concept is called cell food. You see, the cells of the body rely upon us. We have the responsibility of doing the grocery shopping. The reason they rely upon us is because they cannot do the grocery shopping. They would like to be able to tell you what they need, but they can't even do that. They have to take what we give them and then try to figure out what to do. Imagine if you can. They know their menu. They know exactly what they need. But we have never been told. Therefore, we don't even know how to do the shopping. That becomes a real problem. You see, we have been feeding these cells people food. And there's a difference between people food and cell food. Show you a very, di uh, very simple way. If you had some beautiful dogs, you would feed it dog food, right? The best you could find. What about rabbits? You wouldn't feed rabbits dog food, would you? You'd feed it rabbit rabbi food. You've got 75 trillion cells. What are you going to feed them? Yeah. Cell food. All we've got to do is find what do you need, you see. Now, what do you need? When I wrote the book, The Cancer Answer, I had a great experience because I found, contrary to popular belief, that all cells of the body have the very same menu. All human cells throughout the entire world, regardless of where you are, or what country you live in, or your nationality or anything else, all human cells need the same nutrients. 
regardless of your age, you all need the same nutrients because each cell individually needs the same nutrients. And our scientists know what those nutrients are. They're not a secret. We just haven't been told. All right. Today I'm going to tell you the nutrients. And in fact, the best way to explain cell food would be to point out that if the cells had the opportunity of pushing the grocery cart through the grocery store, that would be the best way to find cell food. They don't have that opportunity. The first thing you would find is if the cells did push the grocery cart through the grocery store, they would not do the shopping in the middle of the grocery store. Not where you find the bottled, boxed, and canned things. These are all preserved things. These things came through a factory. And because they came through a factory, we find that they are less than what they were, the nutrients were at the beginning. You see, if the cells had the opportunity of doing the pushing of the grocery cart, they would go around the perimeter, because that's where you find the fresh fruits, vegetables, whole grains, fish, and fowl. This is presented in the book, The Cancer Answer. However, I had a rather exciting experience about two years ago. I was at the National Health Federation, um, standing at my booth one day when a gentleman came by me. I recognized him. He recognized me. He used, his name was Bob Blomberg. Some of you might know him, right? Bob Blomberg is a very uh, interesting gentleman. Um, he's also a certified reboundologist, meaning he came to take my course, and he became certified as a reboundologist. He came up to me and he says, Al, uh, I've got a brand new product. I says, that's good, congratulations. He says, I'd like you to try it. I says, Bob, do you know that's what everybody here would like me to do? They would all like me to try their product. He says, yeah, but this one's different. I said, that's what they all say. <laughs> he handed me a bottle. It was a white bottle. It had orange letters on it. He says, I'd like you to try this. I opened the bottle up. I smelled it. And I says, can you change the smell? <laughs> then I tasted it. I says, forget the smell. Change the taste. <laughs> he, then I says, Bob, you know that I wouldn't put anything into this body unless I really knew what it was. He says, well, Al, what I really want you to do is that I want you to tell me what's wrong with it. Oh, I can do that, because I had just finished writing the book, and I knew what the cells needed, and I'd like to try it out. So I says, all right, you give me a list of the ingredients of this product, and I'll tell you what's wrong with it. He says, all right. So he handed me something like this. I said, thank you very much. I put it in my pocket, and I went home. And when I got home at night, I opened up, I turned on the light over the desk, and I opened up all my books, and I began to look at this little piece of paper. And at first, I was very angry. I was angry because I could not find the list of ingredients. You know, where it's minimum daily requirements of all of the ingredients. I said, Bob gave me the wrong piece of paper. I can't find the ingredients any place. And then I looked here and I said, oh, wait a minute. Interesting plants. I recognized most of them because they're in the herbal books, and I opened up my little herbal Bible and began to study them over and so on. But you see, I wasn't studying them to find out what the herbalists say about the herbs, because I knew that they were good. What I was really looking for was what was in each one of these. You see, as a medical journalist, I know that the cells need 57 nutrients. And the high on the list of 57 nutrients were the 20 amino acids. Now, why do the cells need 20 amino acids? Because they're human cells. And human cells need 20 amino acids in order to produce a human protein. All of the proteins of your body were manufactured by the cells themselves, and they have to have all 20 amino acids. In fact, if you only have 19 amino acids, when it gets ready to produce a protein molecule, the cell simply cannot produce a protein molecule. It's got to have all 20 amino acids. Half of the amino acids are known as non-essential. The other half are known as essential, which is a misnomer. All amino acids are essential in order for your body or your cells to produce a protein molecule. The reason they're called non-essential is because the cells are smart enough to manufacture half of them themselves. But all amino acids are essential. So that's the first thing I begin to look for. Do they have all of the essential amino acids? I went through all of the various plants and I found all 20 amino acids. Put down a mark. Like, yep, contains all 20 amino acids. Even the most rare, even the tryptophan, it contains all amino acids. 
Then the next thing I began to look for were the vitamins. Now what's a vitamin? See, we don't know what a vitamin is. We've been taking them from the since we're that tall. You know, they come in various sizes, like dinosaurs and a few things like this. But when you ask the question, what is a vitamin? I've had some people say, well, it's something you get at the health food store, you find in little brown bottles on a shelf, you see. It's a food supplement. Isn't that what we've been told? We've all been told it's a food supplement. It's not a food supplement. It is a food vital. In other words, when our scientists begin to study what makes this body tick, they found out there are certain things that the body needed in order for the body to function the way it's supposed to. And these chemicals were identified then and labeled. And the first one they found and labeled was vitamin A. I'll bet you can't guess what the next one they found. Let's go. Oh, that's right. Very imaginative at that time, you see. And the next one they found was vitamin C. Oh, we're on a roll, aren't we? Except we ran into a problem. The problem is that the scientists found certain chemical signatures of the chemicals that were almost like vitamin B. So they went back to vitamin B, erased that, changed that to vitamin B1. Then the next one they called vitamin B2, B3, B4, B5, B6, right up to vitamin B17. All right? But you see, the term vitamin means vital. All vitamins are important. All vitamins are necessary. It's part of the cell's menu. They need all vitamins. So that's the next thing I look for. Does it have all vitamins? And that one was easy. If you look under alfalfa in that particular uh, preparation, you find it says contains all known vitamins. That one's easy. Mark it off. Contains all known vitamins. The next thing I begin to look for were the minerals. Now, what, what in the world is a mineral inside the body? Why do we need minerals? We know we're supposed to take them because we've all, be, all been told we are supposed to take them. But what is the function of a mineral inside the body? Do you know that the amount of active minerals in the side of the body right now wouldn't even fill a thimble as big as the little finger? Yet those, th th uh, those uh, trace minerals are so vitally important. Why are they vitally important? What's the function of a mineral inside the body? Maintain the electronic, uh, electronic balance? No? No? Let me explain the function of a mineral. It's so amazing. You see, if you study the cells of the body, you'll find that all of the activity done inside the cells, all activity is done by enzymes. You can use a, a, the word enzyme, or another word would be factory worker. Anything done inside a cell is done by an enzyme. Anytime the DNA needs to communicate with an enzyme, it sends an electronic message out to the enzyme. If you study an enzyme, you find that an enzyme is a protein molecule with a trace mineral at the end. Each trace mineral has its own electrical frequency. So the DNA sends an electronic message out to the enzyme and is picked up by the trace mineral. And the trace mineral tells the enzyme what it's supposed to do and where it's supposed to go and how it's supposed to function. Without the trace mineral, that enzyme cannot function. You see, the enzyme is the walkie-talkie or the, the trace mineral is the walkie-talkie of the enzyme. So, we need all trace minerals because we have thousands of uh, enzymes in the body and each group of enzymes has its need for its own trace mineral. If a trace mineral is missing, then those groups of enzymes simply cannot function. And do you know that the enzymes are the things that actually utilize the vitamins? And if you don't have the uh, trace minerals, the enzymes don't work, and if the enzymes don't work, you can't even use the vitamin, even if you had it. So the next thing I began to look for were the minerals. I found all the minerals. Oh, I was very excited by now, and it didn't take too long before I, before I found the linolenic acid and the lecithin, and these are the e essential oils. And by the time I got through and totaled everything up, I found we had 57 nutrients, all in proper sequence, in proper ratio. I could hardly wait till I saw Bob the next day. I, I went back the next day and I says, Bob, do you know what you've got? He says, yeah, it's a good product. I says, no, Bob, do you really know what you've got? He says, well, yeah, it tastes good. I says, you can't say that. <laughs> but what have you got? He says, well, you tell me. I says, well, let me put it this way. If I wanted to reward Larry Lymphocyte for doing such a fantastic job for keeping me healthy, I'd say, Larry, I'm going to take you out to dinner. What would you like to eat? He'd probably say, KM. 
<laughs> because KM is a good example of a cell food. And it's rather exciting when you consider the source of KM. Consider the source that, the, in fact, it was a scientist 67 years ago who understood what the plants had to offer. Understood that we were animals, some more so than others. <laughs> but as animals, we relied upon the plant kingdom for sustenance. And he also understood the animals because he had a PhD in that uh, area also, and he simply took the knowledge of what he could get out of the plants and what the animals needed, he put it together, and 67 years ago, he came up with the cell food. And that's why it works. It's nothing more than that, but it's nothing less. And that's why it is such a good product and why so many amazing things happen. Because if all of the cells are fed properly, then the cells are going to be healthy. And if the cells are going to be healthy, then you are going to be healthy. Can you see how simple that is? All right, the next part is cell exercise. Cell exercise. As an exercise physiologist, I recognize right away that the exercise industry only teaches us two types of exercises. Aerobics, which is designed to exercise the heart, the cardiovascular system, and strength. Those are the exercises designed to strengthen the striated muscles. In fact, it's almost as if the entire exercise industry thinks of this human body as being one big heart supported by muscles. And in fact, if any other part of the body is ruined while you're in the process of exercising the heart and the muscles, that's just the price you have to pay. For example, Dr. George Sheehan, a confirmed long distance runner and a cardiologist, has made the statement, if you're going to run, you've got to be willing to pay the price, which is shin splints, ankle problems, knee problems, lower back problems, and blisters. And if you're not willing to pay the price, don't run. You see, what we need to understand is this is a whole community of cells and all cells rely upon each other for what is known as homeostasis or proper chemical balance. And therefore, all cells have the capability of becoming stronger or weaker depending upon activity. Therefore, rather than exercising the old-fashioned way, exercising only the muscles or only the heart, what we need to do is we need to become more sophisticated. We need to exercise the most advanced way we know of, and that is a cellular exercise. Now, in order to do that, we need to come up with some very scientific ways of doing this. Let's get right down to the very basics. The very basic is that every exercise you can think of has one thing in common. The common denominator of all exercises is opposing gravity. Isn't that right? Think about that for a minute. If you do push-ups, what force are you pushing away from? Sit down on the floor and do setups while forces pulling the back down. Gravity. If you're going to walk, or jog, or run, these are aerobic exercises. You've got to take the center of gravity. It's around here someplace, right? To some of those, it's moved slightly forward. <laughs> but regardless of where you find it, you've got to take the center of gravity, move it off of space till you start falling forward, and then you've got to oppose gravity by taking a step. Or you're going to fall on your face. Weightlifting, the word weight by definition is mass times gravity. Even swimming. What is it that pulls down on the water hard enough to make it dense enough to have something to resist against when you swim? Gravity. So you see, the common denominator of all exercises, quite simply, is opposing gravity. Now that we've established that very simple fact, let's build upon it. We go back to Albert Einstein to find the next thing we're going to use. Albert Einstein says the human body cannot tell the difference between acceleration, deceleration, and gravity. These are two other forces. Two forces we've never thought of harnessing up when it comes to exercise, but they exist. We have learned to cope with them. We learn to use them when it comes to transportation. You get into an automobile, you step on the accelerator, and you feel a force pushing you back in the seat. That's not gravity. That's the force of acceleration. It's real. You want to slow down or stop, you step on the decelerator or the brake, and you feel a force pushing you forward. That's not the force of gravity. That's the force of deceleration. It's real. These two forces exist. The body cannot tell the difference between acceleration, deceleration, and gravity. Gravity is always like this. We've been experiencing acceleration and deceleration like this. All we have to do is put it in the same plane as gravity. That means vertical. As soon as you line them up with gravity, you've developed a revolutionary new form of exercise called 
rebound exercise. And it is a true cellular exercise. Now to demonstrate this form of exercise, I brought with me a piece of equipment. This particular piece of equipment was developed in uh, Hong Kong when I was a paid consultant to the Hong Kong government. I was over there to teach the health benefits of the healthy cell concept to 7,000 firemen and 28,000 police officers. I took with me 12 pieces of equipment. Three weeks later, I was invited into Hilton Chon Ling's office. He was the chairman of the Hong Kong government. He said, Mr. Carter, we have accepted rebound exercise as the form of exercise, but we cannot accept the equipment. All 12 pieces of equipment have fallen apart. He then introduced me to three engineers, and then he gave us the assignment. In one week, I want to have a better piece of equipment. And it was one of the most exciting experiences of my life to be able to work with three engineers to simply dismantle, take apart the entire concept and the function and put it back together the best way possible. The first thing we studied was the mat. We found we could not use nylon, plastic, or canvas because all three of those fabrics stretch. We went to Permatron. It's a DuPont fabric, but it doesn't stretch. It's also very resilient. Therefore, 10 years from now, this mat will be the same uh, have the same resili resiliency as it has right now. The next thing we studied were the springs. The springs are number 80 carbon steel springs. Now, you can get other springs, a 60 carbon steel spring or a 72 carbon steel spring. A 60 carbon steel spring stretches. A 72 carbon steel spring is brittle, it breaks. We went to the number 80 alloy carbon steel spring and simply solved the spring problem. But you notice the springs are not directly connected into the frame. They're connected to a bolt that goes through the frame. The reason we did that is that if you connect a spring directly to the frame by drilling a hole, then every time you bounce on the mat, the spring will wear the frame out in 36 different places. We could not accept that. So we put a bolt through the fr frame. It's more expensive, but it's more durable. And now we've simply got a frame that does not wear out. If you have a frame that doesn't wear out, a mat that's very resilient, and the springs that don't stretch, now you've got a piece of equipment we could take back to Hilton Chon Ling and show him that we had a piece of equipment that would meet or exceed the standards necessary for the Hong Kong Police Department. To use this piece of equipment, we simply sit it down on the floor like this, check all of the springs to make sure they're all in their proper place, and then simply snap it open. The next thing we have to do is put the legs in place. But you notice the legs do not screw on. Uh, there must be some Chinese axiom that says, anything that can be screwed on can be screwed up. <laughs> <laughs> so rather than having threads, these are held in place by springs, providing positive tension. So once the leg is snapped into place, you don't have to worry about it going into place. Once we have the legs in place, all we have to do is set it down on the floor like this, and now we're ready to participate in what is now known as the most efficient, the most effective form of exercise yet devised by man. Rebound exercise. All I have to do is change into my exercise clothes. So if you excuse me for just a few moments. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now as I stand here in front of you, I weigh approximately 165 pounds. And if I don't do anything at all, I still weigh 165 pounds because that's the amount of gravity pulling down on every cell in the body. But something miraculous happens when I begin to move up and down. As I start to move up and down like this, I no longer weigh 165 pounds at the bottom of the bounce. In fact, at this height right here, I weigh approximately 200 pounds. That's a 25% increase in resistance. Now, I've got to ask you a very technical question. How many cells of the body share with that increase in resistance? All, All cells share that increase in resistance? Mm -hmm. yeah. If you go back to medical physiology, you'll find that every cell has the unique capability of automatically adjusting to its environment. We've just increased the environment by 25%. What has to happen to every cell in the body? They have to become stronger. Tell me, do they have a choice? Isn't that exciting? <laughs> even I have to take my fingertips and put them in my pockets like this and move up and down like this. Even the fingertips on my hands in my pockets are going to get stronger and they don't have a choice. Now, keep in mind, I qualified for the Olympics twice. I had some of the best wrestling coaches in the world telling me you had to do some of this and some of this to exercise this. And what I'm telling you is diametrically opposed to everything you've learned about exercise. 
that if you move up and down like this, this is a cellular function, and every cell in the body, regardless of where it is, is going to become stronger. <laughs> That's part of the theory of rebound exercise. That's what we presented to the people of Hong Kong. Well, when I came back from Hong Kong, I had a letter on my desk from NASA inviting me to go to Ames Research Center to teach rebound exercise to our astronauts. Well, why do the astronauts want to know about rebound exercise? Well, in 14 days of space flight, they lost 15% of their bone mass. They could not jog as you and I could jog because if they were to trip and fall, they would shatter. So they needed a non-traumatic aerobic exercise. And they felt that rebound exercise was it. Well, I agree with them. You get up here and you do this. And would this qualify as an aerobic activity? Sure. But it's non-traumatic. Rebound exercise eliminates seven-eighths of the shock to the skeletal system, which means I've eliminated shin splints, ankle problems, no, uh, shin splints, ankle problems, knee problems, lower back problems, and other problems. But if this is a good aerobic exercise, what about this one? Why, oh, that'd be even better, right? And if this is a good aerobic exercise, there's nothing to stop you from carrying on an aerobic activity like this. In fact, if you want to get ready for the athletic event, such as basketball, football, track, racquetball, or anything else like that, well, all you have to do is carry on a more vigorous activity. And in fact, if you want to compete for the Olympics, why, there's nothing to stop you from carrying on a very, very, very rigorous aerobic exercise like this. The most important thing is I've just finished my aerobic exercises. <laughs> but I've got to warn you, I've left a few things out of the aerobic exercises. I've left out barking and biting dogs, 10-speed <laughs> bicycles, carbon monoxide poisoning, mailboxes that show up unexpectedly. <laughs> I've left out rain, sleet, snow, gravel, grass, curbs. I've replaced it with the television, the air conditioner, the radio, or the heater. Notice I've got a, fan, a family room, so I don't have to worry about getting babysitters. And notice that one size fits all feet. <laughs> Which means that I don't have to worry about buying expensive running shoes. It also means that if I'm not using it, my wife can use it. If she's not using it, it's available to the children. And if they're not using it, grandma and grandpa can use it. How many people need aerobic exercises? Everybody. How many people need the shock of hitting a hard surface? Nobody. Very good. So it's not only good for the astronauts, right? It's good for everybody. The next exercise I'd like to present to you then is what we call the strength exercises. Keep in mind, people go to health spas, spend a lot of money for membership. Their purpose is to become stronger. Well, let's follow some f simple formulas of strength. If you go to an exercise physiologist and ask him, what is the formula for strength? He'll, he'll tell you stress times repetition equals strength. Isn't that right? You grab a hold of a barbell and you do this, and you do it over and over and over again, and you can depend on becoming stronger. But you know as well as I do that if you do this with a barbell, you're going to reach a plateau. And when you reach a plateau, your instructor will tell you to go to a heavier weight. You put on heavier weights and you still do the same thing over and over again. We're going to use the very same formula. Stress times repetition equals strength. Only this time, instead of worrying about the plateau, instead of adding weight, all we have to do is add altitude. You see, the higher you go, the faster you come down. The faster you come down, the greater is the force of deceleration. The greater the force of deceleration, the more you load the springs. The more you load the springs, the greater is the force of acceleration. You add the increased acceleration to the increased deceleration to the gravitational pull, you've developed a whole new g-force. At this height, I weigh two g's. That's twice the gravitational pull. That means that every cell in the body has to start to become twice as strong. You see, I'm 49 years old. I've never lifted weights in my life. But at age 49, I can still do over 100 one-arm push-ups. And I used to brag about that. Tell my son did 125 just to shut me up. <laughs> my son Darren is presently five times Washington State wrestling champion, two times national wrestling champion. He has never lifted weights. He didn't have to. He was involved with the most efficient, the most effective form of exercise yet devised by man all of his life. All right, now, what I've presented to you is something that simply makes all other exercise systems obsolete. Think about it for a minute. That's pretty good, don't you think? We are taught aerobics, and we're talking about strength. We've done that right here. 
But the most important exercise is usually left out. The exercise for health. Have you ever heard about that? The health exercise. You see, your health is your wealth. If you have your health, you can go after your wealth. But if you don't have your health, you'll spend your wealth to try to regain your health. So if I could show you an exercise that would help you become or maintain your health the rest of your life, I don't think there's anything more important that I could present to you today. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to present to you the health exercise. Are you ready for this? Okay, here we go. According to NASA, this is the most important single physical activity you could do on a daily basis. <laughs> Can you handle this one? There it is, right here. Now don't get me wrong. If you want aerobics or endurance, you need to jog or run or do something like this. If you want strength, you need to go to a health spa and lift iron or do something like this. But if your purpose for exercising is for the health of it, all you need to do is this. Because this is the exercise that will stimulate the activity of the lymphatic system. The lymphatic system is found in chapter 31 of medical physiology. The lymphatic system is a system of tubes that start in the toes and fingertips and work up throughout the entire body. The lymphatic system is not connected up to the heart. So it doesn't have a pumping system other than it has to depend on the millions of one-way valves inside the lymphatic system. In other words, it's a hydraulic pressure system. Anytime there's pressure below the one-way valve, the one-way valve opens up. Anytime there's pressure above the one-way valve, it stays closed. As soon as you understand that very simple concept, you can understand how this exercise actually stimulates the lymphatic system. You see, when you go up, the one-way valves are closed. When you come back down, the pressure below opens up the one-way valves. And when you get back to them, they slam shut again. You do this over and over again, those one-way valves open and close. That's millions of one-way valves, a hundred times a minute. The purpose for the lymphatics, it's an internal vacuum cleaner, having the capability of sucking out toxins, poisons, trash, and metabolic waste, making it possible for the oxygen and nutrients to feed the cells. In fact, if every one of us had a little red label across our forehead that said, shake well before using, <laughs> we'd all be healthier. All right, we've just explained to you then the most efficient, the most effective form of exercise yet devised by man. All about that exercise can be found in the book, The New Miracles of Rebound Exercise. A book that has already sold over 1.3 million copies and still going strong. How long do you exercise? How long do you exercise? Uh, let me give you rules of thumb. Five times a day is better than three times a day. Three times a day is better than one time a day, and one time a day is better than no time at all. The next rule of thumb is exercise until you're huffing and puffing. That's going to be different for everybody. But when you're huffing and puffing, that means you're in the aerobic mode. Nobody has to tell you when you're tired, right? Okay. Nobody has to tell you when you're breathing hard. The next rule of thumb, the third rule of thumb is <coughs> never go through a pain threshold. You see, you have an internal doctor telling you when you've had enough. And if you follow those three rules of thumb, nobody will ever have to tell you how much exercise you need. We've got some other formulas, though. Doctor or the uh, NASA indicates that rebound exercise is as much as 68% more efficient than jogging. Therefore, you can take anything you've learned about jogging, cut it in half and put it on a rebounder, and get an equivalent exercise program. Now. We have been talking about rebound exercise, the most efficient, the most effective form of exercise yet devised by man. Something that's already made it to the White House, something that some of our top athletes are, are using, something that a lot of people are using because sometimes that's the only exercise they can do, but many times they're using it because that's the best exercise they can get. But regardless of how good it is, we recognize it's only one-fourth of the healthy cell concept. Anybody involved with rebound exercise should be involved with cell food, don't you think? Mm -hmm. yeah. And anybody involved with cell food should consider rebound exercise. Wouldn't that be fair? Mm -hmm. All right, and anybody involved with cell food and cell exercise should be involved with cell environment, making sure that you get the wa right water. And anybody involved with cell environment, cell exercise, and cell food will naturally gravitate towards good cell communication. The synergistic effect of all four of these will help the cells to become healthy. Now that you've heard the healthy cell concept, I'm going to give you a, an assignment. 
And this is the assignment. <laughs> All right? And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the cancer answer. Thank you very much.